Well, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. First of all, I'd like to thank my last speaker because it's, of course, fairly impossible to top this speech. I think it was really fantastic and motivating and inspiring, even for me, where I'm also working in the sustainability area. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> but I think your talk was really great. L lots of things. I, I did really recognize lots of things which also go for us. So it's good to know that we are on the same platform and to see that we have the same approach towards all those issues, environmental and social and uh, economic issues. Just about Valida, we're not quite 100 years, but just the 90 years. We're quite a bit smaller. I'll just give you a brief overview of what we stand for, what we do, what the brand is. We're a fairly small brand, not, of all, not all of you might know. We're mainly a German-speaking brand, so uh, or, or based in German countries. But I'll give you some da data, and then I'll just tell you like what we do. We consider ourselves as the best case example of a sustainable business. Our business is basically a sustainable business. So we, are, well, our business is based on, on a fairly large uh, amount of biodiversity and sustainability. So I'd just like to show you what we actually do, what our targets are, and how we go along. And it, there's lots of things which are similar to what L'Oreal is doing. So I hope it's not that boring because I can't tell you something else. <laughs> All right, just some facts and figures. So 90 years old, that's clear. We're the leading supplier still for natural and organic cosmetics. Um, we are a market leader, mainly in, uh, in, in Europe. We're not in the US, for example, but if you look at it on a global level, we're the largest brand, so to say, in natural and organic cosmetics. Um, we have a turnover of 308 million last year, which is a plus of about 14%. So we have a good growth. We have doubled in the last 10 years, and as L'Oreal does, we also hope to double in the next 10 years. So um, it, it does pay off well. We use around 1,000 natural raw materials. We just use natural raw materials, so that's different from most cosmetics companies. 100% of our ingredients are natural, and 100% is, or not 100%, but almost 100% is plant-based materials. So we do have some mineral ingredients, etc. of course. Uh, we use around 300 species of plants, which is also a fair amount, so we have a lot of supply chains on, on natural ingredients, which makes sourcing a very big issue in our company. It's, it's one of the most difficult parts, I agree, I, I believe, but then, of course, I come from sourcing, so not as strange as I say that. Um, so we're in 51 countries, we have about, well, it's a bit more now, it's about 2,000 employees. Our headquarters in Basel is a Swiss company uh, with, with German production. We have three main production sites, Germany, Switzerland, and France. This is our, we have one uh, store, which we like to call our uh, flagship store, which is very close here in Paris. Um, in the Rue Hausmann, if you like to visit. So mm -hmm. there's one flagship store. If you like to see, see and feel the brand, it's, it's there where you need to go. Um, we do not sell, uh, we, don't, we do not have a shop concept or something. Only in Japan, we have some Valida shops for the rest. We sell through to our normal sales channels, pharmacies, health food shops, um, and lots of drug stores, depending on the market. But we're slowly coming into mass market. So we're still a small brand, but slowly, slowly. Well, there's big recognition for natural cosmetics, so you see L'Oreal and Estee Lauder and uh, Biosdorf and Henkel and all the others going into that market now. I think we're just about to, to leave the niche market and get into mass markets. That's also where there's lots of, uh, of companies being bought by the big players or by the global players. We've been tried to be bought several times, but we don't want to, we want to stay independent, which is one of our key issues, to stay independent and to keep to our values. Just go into the values quickly. So this has been our slogan since the beginning in harmony with uh, human, uh, humankind and nature. Um, we have really, from the beginning, starting as a very small pharmaceutical laboratory with a doctor and a pharmacist trying to make anthroposophic and homeopathic remedies. That's really our, where we come from, not so much from, uh, from cosmetics at all. Um, so, so the idea was that we do that in harmony with our patients and doctors, so it's very much a a very small uh, operation in the beginning. It was a shed. I, I, sorry, I forgot to, make in a, uh, to put in a picture because it's really nice. It's really like a wooden shed where we started. Um, just from the values, where, when it comes to the human being on the, on the one side, the main issues, of course, as also Francis said, to work in harmony uh, with your suppliers, with all your stakeholders in, 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 in the company. Um, of course, very important for us uh, is, is to work in a harmonious way with our employees and with our stakeholders. We think the employees are our biggest asset, so the quality of our employees will really make the difference in the products we sell and in the, in the processes we, use, uh, we have. And 
as and I can only confirm that the diversity, uh, the cultural diversity, is really an inspiring force. So this is part of our core values. So these are our core values, or the first three of them. So diversity <coughs> is seen as a very key issue in our company. Um, and we also run diversity programs to get that, um, uh, yeah, to get people really to understand each other and learn from each other and see it as an innovation, uh, innovative, what do you call that, uh, like a creative source and not so much as a burden like you're different while well, you're difficult. Difficult. I mean, I, use, I, I now live in Switzerland and it's really not easy as for, for a Dutch guy to live in Switzerland. They're very different. I would, most of you would say they're pretty boring. Um, <laughs> That's why, why my opinion would be, but really we, I, we all have to try hard really to find, to find the positive sides of, of, of each different culture. So that's, that's really a big task to, to join, but it's also very inspiring if you, can, if you can do that. In harmony with nature, obviously, we have very high environmental standards. I would oppose to L'Oreal that we are far better than they are, of course, because our tires are just a bit higher than L'Oreal's, but then of course we are much smaller. So. Uh, we, we try to be climate neutral by 2015, completely, not reduce 50%, we want to be fully. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but um, it's, well, I'm not kidding on that point, but in, in general, we, th we think the WWF have really f uh, didn't look at us when they make the report a couple of years ago. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we have very high environmental centers. We see the earth, which comes very much from the anthroposophic background. We see the earth as a living organism. Which we, which we also, why, this is also why we go so much into organic and biodynamic agriculture. So most of our ingredients are from organic or, or natural, uh, or organic or biodynamic um, cultivation. And then holistic, which is a bit hard to, to explain what is holistic, but we really want to try to see things in relation to each other, which is also the basis of the sustainability model by Brundtland, is really to get those three areas in harmony. So to have a holistic picture, if you influence something on the environmental side, you automatically also have an impact on the, on the other two uh, pillars of, of the sustainability, uh, whatever you call it. You can see it as the circles as you, as you show them. Um, of course, effectiveness is always, uh, well, people want effectiveness, it's quite, quite simple and straightforward. It's always the first point to look at. It must be effective. And of course, natural ingredients. Our, our produc production processes are also a bit special, so we hardly use any chemical, or we do use chemical processes, but it's only green chemistry, no synthetics. Right. Where am I? Sorry. I'll just put the full picture. Oh, sorry. Right. I think that's really Im important that. Our business model is based on ethic, doing business in an ethical way. And um, I think this was one of the questions which came from, from Ms. Myers yesterday. She said, it's not a burden to your bottom line. We see it really the other way around. It's, it's part of our business model. So it's not a burden, it's actually um, a, a plus to your bottom line. So it's our business model to be ethical in all aspects of what we do, not just in sourcing, but also to our employees or to our customers. So really try to integrate that sustainability concept in all the different parts of the supply chain, from the raw material ingredient, from the grower, towards the consumer. And sustainability has been lived in the company all that time. It has never been organized so far, so that's what I started doing last year. We did not have a corporate sustainability strategy, so we thought of let's see what we try to analyze what's there in the world. We have like 17 other companies, so we analyzed what are all those companies doing in terms of sustainability. Then we put all that together and try to focus on what is the main important points uh, in sustainability and where should we get better and have targets that are valid for the group. So there has been lots of things done locally, but it was not well, centrally managed or organized. I think that's quite important if you as a company, you really need to go out and communicate and set targets and say, right, this is the target, this is what we're going to do, um, which is a bit hard, especially for top management or for, uh, because it costs money, first of all, but so you have to really convince them that it, uh, that, um, or it costs money to build up a sustainability department, obviously, and it's very hard to communicate the, 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 the payback. I think you, you, look, you showed us very nice that it really does pay back. If you have a long-term relation with your supplier and you can avoid speculation in the market, you usually have to get a lower price than just buying from any trader. So it does pay back, but we don't have the instrument to measure it. So that's what I'm building up actually at the moment, and building up GRI criteria, reporting and all that. So we are rather at the beginning at 
or the official part of sustainability, but we're doing it since a long time. All right, what we, we now always say that we are uh, in a position that we do not put a label like sustainability on, the, on, on what we do, as lots of companies do um, these days, unfortunately, what we call greenwashing. There's lots of companies which I think are not really have it in their DNA. It's, it's the way they do. It's, it's, it's really trying to, to put on a sustainability program as consumers want it, but it's not in their DNA. And I think we really have that in our DNA. So it's not, it's really integrated into our whole system in all our, of our employees. That's also, of course, the biggest challenge to have all your employees uh, going there and, and thinking, being creative and giving input. I think the examples you gave were very nice. Um, that's also what we try to do to motivate each and every single employee to think in a sustainable way, also in their personal life, not just in the company, but really to get them think in a sustainable way. How can I do things more ecological? How can I save things? And also make it attractive, so not too much by only think about putting the light, lights out and saving water from not flushing or, or, or you know, from, from or when you wash your hands, use less water. We really try to think of it in a, or, or do it in a positive way so we have internal um, <coughs> competitions for the best ID. So if people come up with the best sustainability ID, which really brings savings, so they have to, it has to bring a saving in social or it has to give a surplus. So we really try to make it attractive for our employees to, to run sustainability IDs and to give them to, we have like an IDs management so people can really become active. All right. From this sustainability strategy, we th what we thought is that, uh, as, as has been said, as a company you have a responsibility in, in, in societies. You have an environmental impact, you have a social impact, and you have an economic impact. And we try to cluster the fields which are most important to us. So we, have, we had a lot more fields. We had like 20 different fields, but we clustered the fields, of course, within those three areas. And those are the fields which we, which we selected and we think are mo most important at the moment. So we have a strategy which runs for the next five years till 2015. And within those seven fields, um, we, have, we have specific targets. I won't go through all of them. That would take too long. But I'll give you some main points on what we do and where we stand, actually. Uh, as you see, the, the, the larger the circle, the more important it is. So if you look at it, it it's very much goes into ethical sourcing. It's the right block. Everything that has to do with ingredients, so um, natural and organic ingredients from partnerships. And the second block is fair trade, which goes hand in hand. So we really help suppliers of, uh, to get there, to get to a certain standard. And the other part is more uh, internal and external, so place to work and live, we call it. So we're not just a place to work, but we're also a place to live, or your work is part of your life. So we've specifically run programs for, for our employees to feel at home, to have a good work-life balance. I'll show you a couple of examples later on. One part is sustainable packaging. This is the area where we're pretty poor, actually. Um, the trouble is with natural cosmetics, it's quite hard to get to sustainable packaging because the products are just not stable enough to, to use lightweight or, 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 or innovative packaging. So we, we have to go a long way with that. So I, I did not put that in the presentation, but we actually worked towards getting cradle to cradle certified packaging with EPEA. We worked, well, it's basically three issues. We tried to reduce weight. We tried to increase the recycling uh, of the packages. And most important is to, to redesign. So we really try to work on projects how to redesign our packaging. And the last point is climate neutrality, which is a bit boring or a bit technical, but the idea is to become climate neutral in the next five years. And water, being a cosmetics company, of course, water is a major importance. It's our main source, of it, more main ingredients, you could say. But it's also important looking at, at, at the global perspective. I think water is like the, one of the most, um, or one of the biggest problem if you look at, at, at the global uh, picture. I mean, water supply and, and also wastewater are really big issues. And we feel water will be on the agenda. Right now it's climate, greenhouse gases, climate neutrality. I think water will be more and more uh, in, on the picture. And what we actually do is we are going to try to integrate our suppliers in water management, help to save them water, so get down the water. I'll give you some examples of what we do in terms of ethical sourcing. Uh, the fair trade program running, we just picked a UABT, which is the Union for Ethical Biotrade. 
It's a, it's a foundation based in Switzerland, um, which has a standard for biodiversity, so for native and natural and for well, which, which is called in the Nagoya Protocol access and benefit sharing. You could also call it fair trade or ethical trade or whatever you call it, but it's just a minimum standard for, for fair trading. And we try to implement, we will, well not try, we will implement this, this schedule to all our suppliers by 2014. We have a, of course, as, as, as all the companies do, we have a supplier rating system, so we already take into account lots of quality and transparency issues, so we want to know if it's a pure ingredient and a natural ingredient, and we want to know how it's being processed and where it comes from, so we have 100% transparency on our, on our ingredients already. But it's not fair trade certified or verified, so we want to have a, a fair trade verification system in place where all ingredient suppliers have to go through. And we are also offering them help um, uh, and we'll provide them with a module or, or online or offline menu, uh, what do you call it? online or offline uh, software to put in their data and to be able to measure it. Um, well, I think what, what's been said there, the priority is of course to work in a, in a, in a sustainable way. So it's a give and take. It's not just, it's not just a one way traffic, we really try to work with them together. What we do mainly from when I came 10 years ago, I started in, in purchasing or, and I had, I had to put all the local purchasing departments. We had no international, well, Valeda basically was no international company. We had local units. There was no head office or there was no international marketing or sourcing or quality management. So over the last 10 years, we have sort of integrated all that. I've been responsible for production and uh, part of quality management and sourcing to integrate all this. What we do in, in terms of sourcing is um, that we try to get away as much as possible th through traders. We were buying 95% of our ingredients from trade, not knowing the origin of the product or the process of being, well, the process used to make that product. So direct sourcing has been, has been a very big issue. Uh, also a cost <coughs> issue, so we have cut off lots of uh, uh, traders and importers and exporters and middlemen, especially in the countries of origin. We have gone directly to producers and, and farmers. And we, have, we run about 50 projects worldwide right now. I'll show you two later on, just some examples, so you, ha you see what it, what it really is. And I think key is, well, I wrote down long-term partnerships, but key is really to have uh, trust. So it all goes with trust. We, we have a lots of formulas and questionnaires and evaluation forms and so on, but in the end, it really goes to relationship, to man-to-man, -to -man, trust each other. And of course, you have your organic certification and your uh, whatever, HACP and whatever is needed to have those cer uh, certified and released. Um, but it really comes down on, on, on trusting your supplier or, or building up your, your partnership on a long-term basis. It's sort of, mar I see it as a sort of marriage. You're sort of married to your suppliers as well if you really run projects. Well, wh what's quite special, we grow uh, our own plants, especially medicinal plants, 30% of our turnover is still in anthroposophic and homeopathic uh, remedies, 70% is in cosmetics. We use uh, over 300 spe species for our uh, um, pharmaceutical products, and those, are those we mainly grow ourselves in our biodynamic gardens, so we have three gardens in Europe where we grow them, we employ about 40 people in the gardens, uh, really gardeners, and we process all those plants ourselves. Either we dry them or we make uh, extracts, tinctures, and oil extracts w from them. And we do that biodynamic, which is quite special, but you're all welcome if, you, if you're around uh, Stuttgart uh, somewhere, you're very much happy to, uh, to visit our, uh, our biodynamic gardens. It's really, uh, it's really like uh, heaven for, for people who like plants. Uh, it, it's like a biodiversity hotspot, you can say. It's really nice to visit. Uh, of course, we have no animal testing, and w we do lots of, of, of wild collection projects. We, we have quite a lot of exotic ingredients um, uh, which are either protected uh, or on the red list. Or, uh, so we do try to, to get all those ingredients uh, uh, f from growers and, and try to set up projects. So we have quite a number of projects for wild collection of strophanthus in Malawi or in or Sabadilla in Venezuela and whatever, or, or Ratanya roots for our toothpaste in, in Peru. So we run projects to, yeah, to get that product on a long-term basis. Um, well, as I said, we, we would like to become a climate neutral company by 2015. Um, of course, we are not gonna, uh, gonna get that only by reducing, becoming more efficient. 
uh, we, we run quite a bit of efficiency programs, green supply chain programs on transport and on IT on, and on production, reducing, well, getting more energy efficiency in the factories and, and use less water and all that. I mean, all that regular stuff, which is pretty much boring, you could say, because using less is not always attractive. Um, uh, so we, wh what we try to do, uh, in, in com because we, we will need to compensate part of our emissions, obviously. We will not get to zero otherwise, as we are producing products. Um, I don't know if you disagree, but <laughs> mind me. Hmm? So what we're doing, we cooperate with a, which a Dutch company is called Soil Amor, who invest in uh, organic composting units. Um, and by doing that, um, so, so as a sort of set off, we do not buy um, emission certificates to compensate, but we invest in, in projects uh, in Ethiopia and in e Egypt and India, and they actually generate CO2 certificates. And with that, they also help to improve soil quality because of the organic compost. So we try to reduce the, the impact, the agricultural impact of, of local farmers there or conventional farmers there by giving them organic compost, help to use, uh, to reduce the water, the water um, uptake, uh, no, not the uptake, the, the water use in, in agriculture. So we think there has, it has a lot of positive side effects and it's not just buying some emission certificates from, from China or anywhere else where you can buy them. What we, what we will do, I just mentioned it, we will introduce the water footprint. We don't do that currently, but the plan is to have all, all the water footprint measured in the supply chain, which is quite a challenge, but because it's not so easy to measure, to make a sort of virtual water footprint, you, ha you need a lot of data from all your suppliers and, and from transport and from your production facility, and you need to measure all the wastewater, et cetera. So we, we will introduce a water footprint and get that implemented along the supply chain. So that's quite a big program to have that done for hundreds of suppliers, but we're going to do that. Okay, um, well on the social part, place to work and live, obviously our consumers are, 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 are our consumers, our um, employees are fairly important. <laughs> we have a program which is called the Valida Academy, so we help, we, we do uh, leadership and a leadership program and different workshops in all different uh, in areas. I won't go into detail. Uh, we have quite a bit of programs in diversity management. We have a generation network where people that used to work with Valida can still get into the company, so we use the expertise of people who retire, still in <coughs> mainly in R&D, but also in operational things. Um, we, employ, we, we have different kindergartens, so we have our own kindergartens in the bigger factories. Um, so we provide women, and 70% of our staff is women, uh, places for, for their children or when they, when they become pregnant in our own kindergartens. And we do a lot of training courses also to parents because a lot of mo lots of mothers are questioned how do you, how do you grow or how do you educate a child. So we actually do coaching for mothers and fathers. Um, uh, uh, what do you say? Coming, becoming mothers and fathers? I don't know the word in English. <laughs> All right, just one project. Um, well, Vileda is the largest, I would almost think, uh, user of, uh, of rose oil worldwide. We use about <coughs> two and a half tons of rose absolute a year, which is quite a bit in, for our rose series. And when I started a couple of years ago, um, we noticed that we were just buying that from trade. So I went through to Turkey and Morocco and, and Egypt to look for uh, people who would be interested to convert all that conventional stuff, highly pesticide, uh, with high pesticide use in general to organic. So I visited different grower groups and we found a producer in Turkey uh, who was willing to do, do a try on organic uh, cultivation of, uh, of Rosa Damascena for uh, Rose Absolute and Rose Oil. And I remember it was like a really uh, a nice experience because I was there with our Turkish partner doing a presentation on Veleda. Um, talking about diversity, I did not really understand them. So they were looking like, what the hell is this guy telling uh, <laughs> on cosmetic products? And you know, we gave them some cream. They didn't know how to, how to use the creams. And so it was quite funny. It was just in a village uh, in out, uh, well, somewhere in, in, in Turkey, close to Sparta. And uh, it was an experience because the cultural difference was so big. They really did not understand what I was talking about. And then we got, a, we, we got in someone, a, a Turkish consultant, who explained them what organic agriculture was, and then it was, ah, okay, you're talking about something else. So we, we got 30 farmers interested to, to go into the program, and currently we, run, we have about 250 <coughs> farmers in that program. Um, but 
it, it just shows that it is a long way, so you really need to go into projects and into long-term partnerships, otherwise it won't work, especially when you do projects where you go from conventional to organic agriculture, because it's just more difficult. You have to do a better uh, farm management, you have to control your crops better, you don't, you don't have all those easy methods of, uh, of getting, uh, getting, getting away, getting, um, well, what do you say, or your pest control to, to it is more difficult. Okay, we, we somehow um, managed to do that. This is not the whole thing, so we're right. Nice 350 farmers on 120 hectares. We do similar projects now in Bulgaria and in, uh, in uh, Morocco. So we got three partnerships on, on roads currently. Um, and the thing is that we, we, we see it as a win-win-win situation. So the farmers win because we guarantee volumes, we guarantee minimum prices over five to 10 year periods. So our partnerships are usually between a period of five to 10 years, which is quite long, but it's also the time most farmers need to grow a crop and to, well, and to process a crop to a product and to improve their quality management system and so on. So it's usually a longer period contract but we guarantee minimum prices and volumes. On the other side, we have a direct influence on their quality and we don't have all the speculative trade, which is quite usual in all the ingredients. I mean, all the companies in the room have the same trouble with ingredient prices going sky high over the last couple of years, especially on, on, uh, on plant-based uh, materials, all the vegetable oils, essential oils, they're all going rocket high. And we really, we really managed to keep our cost at the same level over the last two years even with an increased organic share. Um, yeah, right. Well, we, we do have a social program as well, so part of the turnover, usually between three, three and five percent of, uh, of the turnover we make or, which, or our suppliers make in those projects with us goes to social projects. So this is just one example from the Turkish product where, um, it's on the next page, I think, <laughs> where we built a kindergarten in 2009 and we're currently building, um, or I with the project in Moldova, we're building a, a, a small hospital for the villages. So we have different social programs to educate, but also to help them. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's also organic courses, so we do the trainings. We have our own a team of agronomists in the company who do trainings to farmers on organic agriculture or on health issues. So we do quite a lot of um, consulting towards our, our suppliers as well. But this was a big success. All right, one other project. As I said, for us, well, the drugs, you would call it. I don't know if there's any other word, but dried medicinal plants, which are usually called drugs in pharma. Um, that's why I was usually always called uh, the Dutch drug dealer within the uh, village. All right, don't repeat that. <laughs> She's from Amsterdam, so that's pretty <laughs> bad. <laughs> um, uh, wild collection, one, one example is the Arnica. Arnica is one of our lead plants, so to say. We have about 15 different lead plants. Arnica is one of them for our massage oil and bathe products. Lots of people might know. It's one of our lead products. Um, and Arnica is, protect, is a protected species, so you cannot collect it from the wild in Europe as we used to, used to do. So we have started different product, uh, projects, one in the Vogue, Vogue Mountains in France. We got then we got the grower in Germany and a third project in Romania from the Carpathies, from the, from the mountains there where it usually grows, where it traditionally grows or is endemic. And um, the thing is there, there's plenty of Arnica, but it's usually over collected, so there's no sustainable collection. So the total volumes are going down. So we had a hard time um, getting sustainable Arnica from Romania or Bulgaria where it's usually collected. So there was a WWF pro uh, project there, a research project on how to collect or how to run a sustainable collection of Arnica. So we have uh, picked up there because they forgot to commercialize it. They did have a nice <coughs> research program, but they had no customers. So we picked up, uh, I think it's five or six years ago, we picked that up and said, okay, why not uh, commercialize it, the project, and uh, enlarge the collection areas, and make a manual for the, for the collectors on how to collect and give trainings, and we help them build a, well, I'll show you a short film later on. Um, so this was quite, interesting because the main the main problem in that area is that um, um, what's that in English if people leave the leave the agriculture area to go to the city so it's it's like la hmm? Mi yeah, migration to the cities so there's not enough young people willing to collect because the income is too low so what we try to do which which we call our use it or lose it concept usually the environmentalist would say 
you have to protect the species by not using it. We really go the opposite way. Also, in different in different wild collection projects, we see we really try to promote collecting uh, it, in, of course, in a sustainable way. And by adding value to that product, you really can try to keep people doing that. Because collection of wild ingredients is mainly a problem in the pharmaceutical business. It was not just us. There's loads of pharmaceutical companies having trouble with that, with getting good quality wild collected uh, uh, plants. So we managed really to keep people in that region so we still have enough collectors because there's enough income for them in the season to collect Arnica. So we helped to setting up a, com a company, we financed all the drying equipment, uh, we set up a quality management, so we, we really helped setting up that, that company. It's not usual, so we not always do that, we do not always go that far because it's a large investment for relatively small volumes of product. But it's essential, without the Arnica, there's no Arnica line or there's no Arnica product. So we have, of course, with the key ingredients, you really need to well, secure your sources. It's, it's a big issue, as, as also Francis said, security, supply security is, is a big issue. And then do it in an ethical way is the second, big, second biggest point. All right, so these are all the points, support mass management, in quality management, and of course, avoid illegal and over collection in the area, which is the main problem there. I'll show you a short film, I hope. Oh, then there was a nursery, etc., etc. There's a sh short film, it just takes two minutes. I hope it runs. I need to click on it, okay. Where? <laughs> Enter. Can you hear it? A special feature in Romania, here in the Apruseni Mountains, is the rich abundance of the plant the Arnica Montana. The small and yet powerful Arnica plant represents the focal point of a pioneering project. Protecting them has created an alliance between Romanian growers and the environmental organization WWF and Wilida. Florin Pakura provides guidance to the local growers and is Wilida's contact person. We train the people every year. By working together with Walida, we're able to pay them more, but we demand good quality. This means that only open flowers are harvested, very short stems without buds, no dried flowers, and there must always be one flower left on the bush. Wild collecting has been certified organic since 2006. Around 280 growers are involved in the project and they know exactly what is required to ensure that their children will also be able to collect Arnica. Arnica loves the rugged mountain terrain, cold winters and intensive sunlight. Arnica is sensitive to environmental influences and is brimming with vigor. It is also known as wolfsbane. Over 150 ingredients have already been discovered in it. As a medical plant, it can reduce inflammation and it alleviates bruising, strains or simply aching muscles. Arnica helps to restructure damaged tissue and promotes the body's natural healing processes. In the evenings, the jeep brings the day's harvest from the remote farms to the new drying plant. This was pre-financed by Wilida and the WWF and forms the centerpiece of the project of our Romanian partners. Like small suns, the flowers are left to rest for several days at a pleasant 40 degrees. And finally, it all arrives at Wilida. Here, the Arnica has a warm oil bath in fine organic sunflower oil, where its entire potency is able to ooze out. Arnica gives us its best, and from that we make natural body care products and medicines. Have a look at our homepage. Go to the next slide. Just enter again, or? Hmm? Oh, sorry. We don't want that. <laughs> All right, there you go. Right. Well, what's the conclusion, basically? I think I said it before. Uh, this integrated approach of sustainability, so not just looking at ecological sourcing or not just looking at your employees or your stakeholders. It's really about 
having it top down from your strategy towards, towards the last employee. So I think sustainability only works when you integrate it into your whole company. And when you look at it from a holistic perspective, I think it is a nice example um, that, or not example, I think it, it's nice that we do it because it's our business model, but I'm very glad to see that other companies are also going that way. Um, because in the end, consumers really want more sustainable products on the market. Um, I think that's also the first point I mentioned. It's, it's a real business case. So it's not just something we need to do, and it's not just boring because you have to reduce water and light and anything. I think it can be attractive. So, and our biggest, of course, um, challenge is to stay, to stay on top of that market. Uh, because competition is obviously growing. All big players are going into the market, so our R&D will be a big challenge. We've been fairly slow in innovation, so our biggest challenge is going into R&D and getting in, uh, staying in, in that market. And I think what is also quite essential, and this is the cultural aspect, I, I like to quote before um, uh, from uh, Peter Drucker, who said uh, that, that the, the strategy is eaten at breakfast by culture, and that's very true also when you look at sustainability. Um, sustainability should be really in the core of your business and, and you, sh you need commitment from all your employees. So it's, it's a cultural aspect, but it's also the hardest things to do, hardest thing to do to get people, all the people in the company somehow conscious on, on, the, on, the, on the concept of sustainability because the word is not really a buzzword. You need to explain what it is and break it down into really action points uh, which are tangible and, and visible to them. And of the last thing, of course, use natural resources in a sustainable way. Um, I mean, our resources are limited. We are 7 billion people, as we heard, and we use about 1.5 times the planet in terms of resources. So we really need to look at our resources, and we do not only have to reduce the number of resources you use, but we have to be smart and think of uh, uh, brighter ways of using our resources and really trying to reduce our, our, our footprint to the earth. So I think we really need to be very conscious on the resource we have and reinvent the wheels. So if we talk about packaging, for example, you really have to redesign things and not just reduce things. That's where I'd like to close. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Bas, for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, do we have a few questions in the room for Bas? Yes. Ah. Hi, Julie Navarro from Bradford Soap Works. Uh, just, um, you had mentioned biodynamics a number of times, and I was wondering um, what led you to have that be an important component? What percentage of your teams currently right. are biodynamic? You mentioned that you have and do you see it as a trend that's really going to reach mass, or do you see it as more of a niche? Well, trend. Right, the founder of Elida was, was Rudolf Steiner, it's a, a, a German uh, philosopher actually, and a Dutch doctor, Ita Wegman. They were both antrop well, anthroposophy, which was not the term at that time, um, which is basically a way of living or a philosophy, has been started in, 19, in the 1910s, 1920s. And besides uh, homeopathy, homeopathy or, or or natural cosmetics, which was not the term at that time, obviously there was no natural things that, like natural cosmetics. Th at the same time, they developed the concept of biodynamic agriculture. So it has gone hand in hand. Um, so Velida has used biodynamic principles in growing uh, their ingredients straight from the beginning. It's just, I would call it organic plus. So it does not, not look, just look at the input and output. If you grow something, you would just measure uh, the input and output of your soil and your water and so on. The biodynamic goes a bit further, so it looks like uh, looks at the farm as a whole, as a holistic uh, entity. So we look at the people and the animals and the plants which grow there, and if they grow in harmony. So that's really, well, in a very simple way, what is biodynamics. Um, you cannot say it's a trend, and I don't think it's growing very fast. It's more a trend in the U.S. It's, for example, it's a trend in French whining. So there's loads of French wineries now going to biodynamic agriculture because the wine is just better and the, and the agriculture works well. And in the US, especially biodynamic is a buzzword, so um, a bit of a buzzword at least. So biodynamic tends to get a lot, a lot of attention in the US markets. In the European markets, we are not specifically marketing that. It's just really the core of our business. 
I, and I can't really say what percentage organic is because we don't measure it. We just look at everything that is organic certified, whether it being biodynamic or any other organic certification. So our total, our total number is 74% currently in organic and biodynamic. And the target is to reach 80%, at least 80% in 2015, which is already quite a bit. Uh, I, I can't really say how my, what the percentage is in biodynamic. Yeah. Any other question? Just a question, uh, Bas, uh, to be a little bit uh, provocative. Yeah, sure. Um, you talk a lot about uh, the social part of the sustainable development. You talk a lot about the environmental part yeah. of it. You don't say much about the economical part. So how do you make sure that the model is uh, really sustainable? Well, hard to answer. Uh, I mean, in the end, the profit and loss statement should show and the growth rate should show if the, mm -hmm. if the business is sustainable. I mean, um, the former speaker started with that. So he said it's a sustainable business because we are 90 years old and because we grow with 10 to 50 percent a year and because we make profit. So, yes, it's a sustainable business and it seems to work. And it seems to work since a long time. So obviously it's not a, uh, a short term thing. Um, so if that's the answer, uh, no, that's yeah, I think that's, I, think I mean, so. and I think if you look at it uh, from a sourcing point of view, it's very much what you do to uh, guarantee the supplier to have a decent income and to be there in five years. So if you look at sustainable relationships, is making sure that he's not the supplier next year only, but also in the next ten years. So um, I think, uh, just, well, economic sustainability is always part of negotiation, and. Uh, fair trade goes with that, so you look, we look at cost prices and you would look at fair price in the market. So we don't, well also in our sales uh, strategy, we don't go into premium markets. We want to be a democratic brand, so to say, which is quite affordable. So we're not going into very high-end markets where we could, but we don't want to. So we want to be accessible also in that sense, which is also part of the economic sustainability, I would say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank no you. more? Thank you very much, Bas. <laughs>